Harry Brednicki is the kind of man they write books about. In fact, Captain Brednicki was the real-life captain of the Coast Guard ship that performed two dramatic rescues during the perfect storm. Over his 30-year career, he supervised more than 15,000 search and rescue cases, which saved 1,600 lives. He is the recipient of the Legion of Merit and the Coast Guard Medal for Heroism, and we are proud to have you on the program, sir. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, first off, I, you know, having, having been in what they call the perfect storm and uh, having seen the movie myself, I have to ask you, uh, what, when you see the waves in that movie, uh, they are just uh, hair-raising. Uh, from your point of view, when you were uh, in the, in the uh, search and rescue mode out there, uh, was it every bit as bad as we saw it on the screen? Well, people ask that question, how big were the waves? Right. And my best answer is they were really big. <laughs> <laughs> now, normally it's not difficult to estimate wave height. You stand on the bridge of the ship, you look down at the tops of the waves. Our bridge is 40 feet above the water. We're looking up to the tops of the waves. Oh. Weather buoys are recording wave heights of a whole, over 100 feet. Uh -huh. Now, were they 100 feet? I don't know, but they were really big. Now, with respect to the movie, during the Coast Guard scenes, the weather was actually worse than what was portrayed in the movie. Wow. But when you get to the very tail end of the movie, if you're going to kill off George Clooney before the movie's over, you need something really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and for those final scenes, the waves were probably about twice as high in the movie as they were in reality. I see, I see. Yeah. When you got the word that day, I'm sure that this was something that you had been following uh, via radar and, and, uh, and, and the alert was out that this was going to be really something. Uh, give me an idea of what, uh, of what your instincts were telling you on that particular day. Well, the, this storm was very different than most storms mm -hmm. because it was a combination of three independent weather systems. A low pressure stalled out over Sable Island, Nova Scotia, and extreme high pressure systems being propelled southeast from Canada on the jet stream and the extreme low pressure of Hurricane Grace is coming up from the Caribbean. When you take an extreme high pressure and extreme low pressure and they're headed right for each other, it's like two freight trains on a railroad track. Uh -huh. The isobars are getting closer, you know you're going to have tremendous winds which are going to create the big seas. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's known. But which way is the storm going to track? There's no model to predict it. Mm -hmm. And normally off the east coast when you have the hurricanes, they'll come up and then they head out to sea to the east. Well, as it turned out, this storm headed to the west, which is, which is not normal. And as the Weather Service, National Weather Service, is, is putting out to expect really, really bad weather, people are standing on land, blue sky, sunshine. Mm -hmm. oh, if, if it's really going to be bad, we'd be overrun with bad weather right now. What they didn't realize is they should have been looking uh, to the east instead of looking to the west. Wow. So, so it was expected to be bad, and it was. Well, now, is there a point at which uh, a weather system gets so bad that the U.S. Coast Guard says there is no way that we can send out a vessel in this? Yeah. Well, you have to remember, search and rescue is a mission, not a requirement. Uh -huh. And if we're directed to go and assist someone, we have to use our judgment. You're not required to kill yourself or your crew in the process mm -hmm. of rescuing someone. And if you th can't, think you can't do it, then you should back off. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not going to rescue those people anyway, and you're going to die in the process, that doesn't serve any good purpose. Mm -hmm. But if you can rescue them, you want to. Because I'll ask you the question, how do you stand there and make a conscious decision to watch someone die? Yeah, you can't. It, it, it's, it's difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what did you encounter when you went out in, into that weather? I mean, uh, how, uh, I mean, how hairy was it? Well... <laughs> The, I can say the waves, were, I mean, they looked as big as mountains. Right, and as right. we're going up and down the waves, uh, our rudder and propeller are coming out of the water. Hmm. Uh, of course, there's a scene in the movie when the actor who plays me gets upset with his helmsman because he stand, can't steer a steady course. And I always say, well, if I were the helmsman, I would say keep the rudder in the water. It's easier to steer. <laughs> the problem with the, the, rut, the propeller is, is even different because, remember, this is designed to push 1,600 tons horizontally through the water. Right. And as soon as it comes out of the water, there's no resistance. The propeller speeds up. The current going to the main motor is going to skyrocket, and you're going to start a fire in your main motor. So for hours on end, as we're 
stern keeps coming out of the water, we have to have people down in the engine room using manual control because the normal electronic control doesn't work under conditions like this. Mm -hmm. Power ahead when you're in the water, pull back when the propeller's sticking out of the water, right, power right. ahead and back and forth for, for hours on end. I think I read somewhere that you that the one thing that you uh, that you objected to was the term perfect storm. No, I never object, objected to that, and that that wasn't called a perfect storm at the time. Uh -huh. It was so big, people thought it deserved a name. Some newspapers, magazines called it the No Name Storm. Right. Others called it the Halloween Storm. People thought it deserved a name. Yeah. The name actually came about when Sebastian Younger, the author of the book, was talking to Bob Case, a meteorologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, because he really wanted to know. How do you measure a storm? Right. And as Bob Case was uh, discussing it with him, he's basically saying that this storm was so bad, it couldn't have been any worse. That made it the perfect storm. Because mm -hmm. we think of the word perfect storm as an oxymoron. The words don't go together. Right, right. But if you were going to design a storm, mm -hmm. this would be the perfect model for designing one. Hmm. Well, now you, you have gone through the country yeah, and I was actually going to going to mention this later, but you've gone through the country, talking about uh, leadership lessons that you have learned in various crisis situations, and uh, th th this is something that uh, uh, this is something that you know so something about because you've been in, in situations that uh, could be called management under stress. Uh, well, in this particular case. What was, what was one of the lessons that you learned from what they call the perfect storm? Well, no matter how much training you do, no matter how many rescues you perform, mm -hmm. when you get into a situation like this, something you have done in, in training or real life a thousand times before doesn't work. Hmm. Now come up with a new plan and uh -huh. you got a minute. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you do that? Well, you have to take the sum total of all your knowledge and experience and relate it to what you can do now. Uh -huh. Now, I had served on a couple of buoy tenders. Those are the ships that put the buoys near the rocks. Smart navigators stay in the center of the channel in the deep water. We go by the, the edge of the channel near the rocks putting the water in there. And when you're there, you have controls over two forces, your propeller, your rudder. Mm -hmm. You don't have control over the wind and the current. Mm -hmm. So how can you position your ship to take advantage of the two things you can't control, but to try to use them to your advantage, and then use the two things that you can control to make your ship do what you want? Huh. When we were out there, and our ship was built by the Navy in 1943 to tow battleships. Tremendous power. Uh -huh. But this, this storm is, is far more powerful than we are. Right. And the things we normally do don't work. So now how do you go back and relate it to the experience with the buoy tender? What, how, I can't fight the weather. Uh -huh. yeah. How can I use the weather? Right. And then how do I use the power of the ocean to help me do what I want to do? Hmm. It, and and I, it should be said that it helps in there somewhere that you have an engineering degree. Yeah. <laughs> well, the perfect storm uh, certainly one of the one of the, one of the most famous missions that you uh, undertook. Mm -hmm. But there were other search and rescue uh, operations that, uh, uh, in fact, you you told me before the interview you you had an act for being at the wrong place at the <laughs> right time. Uh, uh, Exxon Valdez was one of them. Uh, well, tell was, me about your, well, that, uh, your... that really wasn't a search and rescue case for, for my involvement. Right, right. At the time, I was the chief of, of, of aids to navigation and waterways management for the Coast Guard 17th District, which meant my area responsibility was all of Alaska. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, it's interesting stories. About a month before this happened is when things are set in motion. Mm -hmm. And up in Alaska, we have six buoy tenders. During the winter time, you cannot schedule any work because the weather's too bad. Yeah. So we'll send two ships down to Pearl Harbor to train with the Navy, two ships down to Seattle to go through shipyards, and then there's only two ships left to cover discrepancies in all of Alaska. Wow. One in southeast Alaska where they don't have that much territory, but they have a very high density uh -huh. of AIDS. And the, and the other ship for the rest of Alaska were very low density, but a very, very large area. Uh -huh. And it's about a month beforehand, the commanding officer of the, of the ships, George Capacci, calls me up and he says, well, I have this buoy up in Prince William Sound, Bly Reef Number 6 off station, but the weather's so bad. I, I can't service it safely. Mm -hmm. and I have a lot of discrepancies out the Aleutian chain. And is it okay if I go out the Aleutian chain? 
And I'll never forget the conversation. I said, George, could you imagine how ugly it would get if an oil tanker ever ran aground in Prince William Sound? Really? He said that? <laughs> yes. at that moment? Said, oh, yeah. my gosh. So I said, you wait. Uh -huh. Don't put anybody at risk. You wait until the weather abates and you're satisfied you can do it safely. And I don't care how long that takes. That's your judgment. Uh -huh. And then when you're done, then have the Aleutian chain. Because once they're a thousand miles from home, it's a long way to get them back. Oh, sure. Yeah. So he waited. He took care of Bly Reef buoy number six. Then he headed out the Aleutian chain. And you have to put it in perspective. If an oil tanker runs aground on rocks compared to a fishing boat running aground on sand, mm -hmm. big difference in the risk sure. uh, that, you're, that you're looking at. Well, he's done, he's coming home. 24 hours before he returns to his home port is when the Exxon Valdez runs aground in the vicinity of Bly Reef number six. Oh my goodness. So it was a good thing we had put it back on station. Mm -hmm. And then Exxon Shipping is trying to somehow see if it was the Coast Guard's fault instead of the master's fault. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they say is, oh, the, the, it, it was off station. No, we could prove it was on station. And they said, well, it has a history of uh, not being on station. And we proved it had something like a history of being on station 99.9% .9 of the time. Then they told us, well, it's not in the wrong, right place. And if we were in the right place, there wouldn't have been an accident. Well, what we, we had done was we conducted what we call the waterways analysis management study. We go out to all the people who use the waterway. We send out some of our people on the ships to ride with the masters and the pilots. Mm -hmm. Trying to assess it is, do the aids serve your purpose? Do they not? If you want to change anything, what would you change? And when we got to this part, I pulled the book off my shelf with the analysis, flipped to the page from Exxon Shipping, and said, you got a great system of AIDS navigation in, in Prince William Sound, don't change a thing. <laughs> 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 so sometimes you have to do your, your work long before the crisis with no crisis in sight, other than the general, it's a risk. You have oil tankers coming and going, sooner or later one of them's gonna run aground. Right, right. Now you had a, a, a situation and uh, I can imagine that this uh, uh, had to have been a pretty tense situation uh, uh, where you seized a Chinese vessel. Uh, was, uh, or, uh, what, what was this uh, uh, about? Well, at the time, I was commanding officer of a Coast Guard ship, which was really a destroyer class vessel. Right. I was assigned to a Navy destroyer squadron operating over in Southeast Asia for six months. Mm. And I was getting to the tail end of our deployment when we get a call that we have to divert because a, a Chinese fishing vessel was violating a United Nations moratorium on high seas drift net fishing. Uh -huh. Now this is the most destructive type of, of fishing you can do anywhere. Mm -hmm. Normally fishermen, and I'm talking legitimate fishermen, they target a specific species or a specific t size. Uh -huh. High seas drift net fishing, you take a net that's 80 feet deep, 25, 20 miles long, let it drift in the ocean and it catches and kills anything in its path. Oh my gosh. And then they keep the high value catch and the other 99% they discard. And this would be what, dolphins and whales? Oh and, yes, everything. Uh, yeah, oh my God. So this is, this is, this is incredibly destructive. Right. So there's a United Nations moratorium against that. And any nation that has signed on to this can then enforce that uh -huh. on any other nation that sure. has signed on to it. Well, a Canadian aircraft spotted the Chinese vessel off a of midway engaged in high seas drift net fishing. The nearest a uh, ship of anywhere was a Coast Guard buoy tender that was normally home ported in Guam, but they were actually operating near Japan at the time. Uh -huh. So they were sent uh, to stop them. And buoy tenders work buoys. They look like work boats. Think of a tugboat with a crane. Mm -hmm. They're not very menacing, but they can outrun the, the, the Chinese vessel. And they have 50 caliber machine guns. But in our culture, we don't like the idea of shooting at fishermen. It's, it's just against yeah, our culture. Yeah. Right. So when they went aboard the fishing vessel to stop it, the, 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 the crew on the fishing boats there with uh, fish gaffs and machetes, like in the days of the old pirates, stand by to repel boarders. Huh. So now, are you going to use lethal force to stop them? Well, not if you can do it another way. Right. So I get a call, and it was from the uh, satellite telephone call. Uh -huh. You're a little bit out of cell phone range. <laughs> 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 and it was from the vice commandant of the Coast Guard. And he said, uh, Larry, I want you to know that uh, the Commandant is out of the country attending an international symposium on non-use of lethal force methods to compel compliance by fishing vessels. <laughs> and this would right be a, at that moment. And, and this right. would be a particularly bad time to get someone to get hurt or killed. Oh my and then gosh. I thought I said something like, uh, isn't it 
any time a bad time for people to get hurt or killed? And then I was like, I hope I said that in my brain, and I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, we, we, we can't have this. Uh, you know, the, the fishing vessel uh, just ignoring the United Nations moratorium, ignoring the United States vessel. Right. Well, we're a destroyer-class vessel. We, we look a little bit menacing. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit more than a, a, a buoy tender that looks like the, the, the tugboat with a crane. So I'm down in the Gulf of Thailand, and I have to make my way up to the East China Sea. Uh -huh. Now, good thing was he'd just gotten refueled. But now I have to go fast enough to get there before he gets to mainland China, but not so fast I run out of fuel before I get there. Huh. <laughs> so fuel management became a, a fuel management oh, yeah. and speed management became uh, very important. As it turns out, the commanding officer on that ship had served on w one of my commands. Years ago when I was commanding officer, he was one of my young ensigns. And now he's the commanding officer of this, this buoy tender. So it worked out very well. We knew each other. We knew how each other thought. Uh -huh. So we're talking to each other the night before about how we're going to commence the operation. Right. He spent eight days not being able to get the fishing vessel to stop, and it's not his fault because he, he could have stopped it, but only uh, by using lethal force. And now how are we going to do this? So now I'm trying to develop a plan with him. And... It's like in the first 15 minutes that we're on scene, either it all has to be over because the fishing vessel says there's a new sheriff in town and the rules changed, or we're not going to get stopped. Huh. And by now, these, this, this boat's 80 miles from mainland China. Right. So we don't have much time no. to make this happen. Uh -huh. Well, at this point, I almost scripted it like a Hollywood movie <laughs> to, to, to put the, uh, the master into sensory overload, so to speak. Uh -huh. Uh, we're coming at him with a, a destroyer-class vessel, and when we cut across his bow, there's no horizon. All he's doing is looking at our ship. Right, right. We sound general quarters. Uh, and everybody in the world knows that, what that means. Even if you don't speak English, when you hear the general quarters alarm, oh, sure. you know what that means. Yeah. Everybody bursts out the doors, mans every gun, which we're hoping we're not going to be using. Uh -huh. So we have our ship. We have his ship. We have three small boats in the water. We have our helicopter flying over the top of the, uh, the pilot house, blowing wind down on top of it. We have an interpreter that's just reading a script is heave to, have your crew go to the, uh, the bow, and if anyone gets hurt during this operation, it's your fault, master. Now, heave to uh -huh. and stop. And it worked. The, just the, the show of force got them to stop. And they thought we were serious because once our crew got on board and within four minutes of arriving on scene, I had, oh, what was it, 24 armed people on board the vessel. Uh -huh. And with eight minutes of having arrived on scene, we had complete control over the vessel. Huh. And when our crew had them, the, their crew up on the, on, the, on the bow, one of them who spoke English turned to him and said, are you going to kill us? Now, that was never our intent. No. But the intent was a show of force. Exactly. And it worked. Exactly. It almost goes back to the Soviet embargo and the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> Let's wait and see if the other guy blinks. And, and they did. Well, well my the goodness. Is, I didn't want anybody hurt or killed. And no. if we couldn't stop them, then we would have taken video of mm -hmm. them with their fish gaffs, their, their, their machetes, standing by to repel borders like the pirate days, mm -hmm. and then turned it over to the Chinese government in the hope that they would have done something. Right, right. And, and, at, and, and at a point like that, you really, I mean, you really are just right on the edge of an international incident. If the Chinese decided that they wanted to react that way. You oh, know, the Chinese be... government never would have allowed us within their territorial sea. Yeah. A U.S. warship in their territorial sea, that's not going to happen. Yeah. So we had to do it, and it worked out well. And really, that's why it didn't get a lot of news coverage. In fact, I don't even know that it got any news coverage. <laughs> if it did not go well, we created an international incident. Everybody would have known my name because I would have been on the 6 o'clock news every night. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm certainly happy that it worked out the way it did. Um, I, you, you were also telling me that you were the uh, facilities, uh, uh, you, you were the facilities engineer for the second uh, for the second Reagan inauguration, uh, the logistics of, uh, of that kind of an operation had to be nightmarish. Well, it, basically the facilities engineer, which you would think of for a large you know, military base, uh, except it's Washington, D.C., anything to do with the inauguration. Anything outside the inauguration is not 
you know, my responsibility. But anything to right. do with the inauguration, heat, power, light. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to set up metal detectors by the Capitol and people have to go through medical dete metal detectors and you set up fencing and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, roll out power so that all the major networks can connect up to the power to be able to film sure. The, sure. the ceremony and, and things mm -hmm. like that. So that's what I had to do. And I did get to work with the Secret Service agents. And the first thing I learned is never argue with people who carry automatic weapons. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good leadership <laughs> lesson too. Um, but getting back to the uh, uh, subject that we were talking about, the, the, the leadership lessons, uh, to, to kind of tie, tie up in the uh, six minutes that we have yeah. left. Um, uh, in all the years, uh, you know, I, a, as a commander, uh, you would, after everything had calmed down, after everything was over, after the storm had passed, did you on a regular basis sit down and analyze everything that happened oh. and and analyze your actions as well as well as the reactions of your crew and and everything else we would always critique everything we did and it didn't have to be you know something really high high uh, risk mm -hmm. uh, everything we're just coming into port we're more at the ship and then we would critique it what went well what didn't go well what would you, what would you have done different and in doing that is you have the, you know, the person who's controlling the movement of the ship, and there's other people who are up on the bridge watching. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is get them the experience of having moored the ship by talking through everything. Mm -hmm. Now certainly if it was you know, more high risk, more elaborate, the, uh, the discussions would be longer and more in depth. But one thing is you don't learn leadership during a crisis. You don't create leaders during a crisis. That has to happen long beforehand. Mm -hmm. And you start off training people. And then when they get to a certain level of skill, then they start performing real operations. And you start them off with, I'm going to say, low risk operations, right. less right. difficult ones. Mm -hmm. And as they gain confidence in themselves and you gain confidence in their abilities, then you move them up to deal with things that are a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. And then you're slowly working them way up so that you're confident, they're confident that they can handle a job. You just don't throw somebody in. And, and see if it works out. Right, right. Okay. And you have to have people, a lot of those things are team efforts. Mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while you get someone who has a little S tattooed on his chest, he thinks he's Superman, uh, and he's yeah. not going to save the day. Mm -hmm. In fact, he could be very detrimental. Mm -hmm. You need team players, because if I don't do my job, you could end up dead. If you don't you do your job, I can end up dead. Yeah. So you really have to create a, a, a team where people look out for each other, take care of each other. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to the actual evolution is the team has to trust the leader to make good decisions. Right, right. And the leader has to trust the team to carry out the plan. Mm -hmm. And if you have not built up that trust, you're not going to get it in the middle of a crisis. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. And yeah. whenever you're going to have any type of high-risk evolution, I would always bring in my key people, go around the table, see what they had to say. I would never tell them what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Because if I do, then everybody goes, oh, well, that's the plan. Yeah. And then I won't hear what they're thinking. Yeah. So I'd go around the table hearing what they're thinking, and quite often they'd come up with the same thing I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say, oh, great job. Mm -hmm. Let's go with that. And then they owned the plan because they came up with it. I see. And every once in a while someone would come up with something, and you have to be careful because if you shoot them down, it's like, oh, I made a suggestion, and he's never going to listen to me, and I'm not going to make any more suggestions anymore. And you don't want to shut people down. Mm -hmm. So whenever someone would come up with a suggestion that I didn't think was a good idea, I would always try to rack my brain for some situation that was similar where I tried doing something that he was suggesting. Yeah. And saying, well, that's a great idea. Great minds think alike because I tried that in this other mm -hmm. uh, thing. Right. And it didn't work out as well as I liked because of this and that. Mm -hmm. Right. But it's a good idea because I tried it once. And, and there's always, you know, it's inter you make an interesting point about this. So you want to hear everybody's idea around the table. And yet, even if they come up with a bad idea, you don't want to uh, you don't want to discourage this person from speaking up in the future because in the future they might have a better idea. Yeah. And I know? wouldn't even call it a bad idea. Uh -huh. It may be not the best ideas of the choices on the table. Mm -hmm. You that know doesn't what, make it a bad idea. You know what comes to mind? Uh, I, I go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, they're sitting around the table. And JFK says to uh, uh, General Curtis LeMay, he says, uh, so uh, 
what, what, what is your recommendation? And, and LeMay says, I think we should go in there and, and, and bomb the missile sites. And, uh, and JFK says, what do you think they'll do? And General LeMay says, what could they do? And when JFK goes out on the hall, he says he's enraged. You know that, that uh, Lemay thinks that. You know, but uh, but at the same time, he never confronted R R Lemay mm -hmm. for the simple reason that he wanted to continue to hear that voice because he remembered Lemay's record. Yeah. You know, and that, that becomes a an influence in that yeah. in kind of yeah. meeting. And down the road, maybe that would have been what the president thought was the right answer. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. What. What's been the reaction to these uh, leadership uh, lessons that uh, that you have uh, learned uh, as you've as you've gone through the country and and, and told people about this? Uh, uh, wh what do you hear from uh, business leaders and things like that to well, your speeches? Most people I talk to are not going to go out in the middle of nasty weather and rescue. People. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, right. But there are so many similarities between what we do, and and it doesn't matter what industry you're in, you do the same thing. Well, uh, I want to tell you that this has uh, just gone by so quickly, <laughs> and uh, you are a uh, uh, you, you have some fascin fascinating stories to tell, and uh, I do appreciate you being on the program. Thank you, Captain. Oh, it's a pleasure being here. Thank you.